cool. I'm going to mute myself. And you guys go for it when you're I'll just put this on flight mode. Done. Brilliant. So, um, once again, we are here with the Brazilian shirt name podcast. Uh, myself, Dawson Adibayo, and himself. Tim Vickery. And uh, today we're going back to the forgotten semi final. The one that in 30 years of hurt, 55 years of hurt, the one that never seems to hurt. Oh, they always hurt, doesn't it? I mean, uh, trust me, I've, I've fallen in and out of love before. It always hurts. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, this, I suppose, in all of those years of hurt, this was the first cut. So the first cut should be the deepest. Oh, oh, it is. It's the first cut since England won the World Cup in 1966. And oh, our Scottish friends are so tired of hearing that about that, Tim. They just want us to go on and win, <laughs> win something else, for goodness sake, so we can shut up about 1966. But we have to, we have to reference 1966 in this respect. Yeah, because England are the reigning world champions. Um, we're talking about June the 5th, 1968. It's England in the semi-final of the Euros against Yugoslavia. And the amazing thing about this, and England lose 1-0. And the amazing thing of this is just how low-key the whole thing is. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Although the Continental Tournament on my side of the Atlantic, the Copa America, started in 1916, the Euros only started in 1960 for obvious reasons. You know, Europeans were too busy killing each other for, 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 for years before that. And, and so it starts in 60, but it's, it's not really like a tournament. And the tournament is restricted to the semifinals and a final. That's it. You know, you, you've got group phases and then you've got quarterfinals at home and away. And then you get your tournament, which is four games, semi, two semifinals, a third, fourth place off and the final. And that's the way it was until 1980. That's the first time it was a tournament. It was two, two groups of four. It's the first time I remember I'm old enough to, to see England in, in a tournament. And even that was a little bit low key. And then 84 was a great one. But there were none of the home nations there. So 84, you got highlights. And the only thing that we saw live, all of it, was the final, which was France and Platini beating Spain. And then 88, there was England there expecting to win it and losing all their games. And there was Ireland there under Jack Chart and doing fantastic stuff. So 88, I think, is when in the English consciousness, the British consciousness, it becomes serious. A full 20 years after this semi-final defeat on the 5th of June, 1968. It's always a way with England, isn't it, that we don't get it straight away. We didn't get the World Cup straight away, and it took us 20 years or so before we even acknowledged that it was worth competing in that one. And it seems the same with the what is now uh, the Euros, because I, I take your point that it wasn't a tournament in the way that you'd expect it to be a tournament, but we are world champions from 1966, you would have thought we'd want to win absolutely everything, yeah. that we would take this competition seriously just for the trophy, if for nothing else. But it doesn't seem as if we ha we have done. Um, we're straight through into the semi-finals, like you say, against what was then Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia were no mean shakes. You know, we no. knew that from before. They've been around for a long time. If nothing else, Red Star Belgrade resonated with me on the streets of Tottenham mm. in the 60s. Do you know what I mean? It, why, why would I have heard of Red Star Belgrade? For, I didn't even know where Belgrade was. But they were clearly a force to be reckoned with. But we didn't take this tournament seriously. Yeah, nor this and, match, I would say. And, well, they, they played a, just before this game. They played a game against Germany played a friendly against Germany and uh, they messed about in that one. And it's the first time we ever lost to Germany uh, and it was a weakened side uh, and uh, it was a bobbly pitch and the players were wearing sponsored boots. They're getting paid for wearing these boots. So they're all wearing, wearing these unfamiliar boots and they lost that one. And uh, they also lost Jeff Hurst. And that's absolutely vital because England, this is still before substitutions. 
substitutions come in for the 1970 World Cup, as far as England were concerned. And the manager, the coach, Alf Ramsey, didn't really know anything about them. You know, he didn't really know how to do substitutions because he'd never had to do it before. And in 68, in these games, there is no substitutions. So his big centre forward, the hero of, of 66, Jeff Hurst, isn't fully fit. And can't because there are no substitutions, you can't risk it. You know, because he's going to, if, if he if he pulls up, he's going to be hobbling around on the, on the on the left wing. And he hasn't really got any other strikers. I mean, he's, he's 4-4-2. It was Roger Hunt and Jeff Hurst. He's still got Roger Hunt, but Roger Hunt is, is at the end now. He's coming to the end and he doesn't play much more. The other stri- the only other striker in his squad is Jimmy Greaves. Now, Jimmy Greaves hasn't played for a year and would never play again. So Ramsey clearly thinks he's passed it, but he's still there in the squad. And without Jeff Hurst, he's just left with no, he's, he hasn't got any strikers. So he, he, I think he pushes Bobby Bobby Charlton further up, uh, and this is you, you can see him in uh, in the wake of this defeat, thinking, "Oh yeah, yeah, I better do something about this." So for the World Cup two years later, Franny Lees comes in comes into the side, and also in the squad are Alan Clark, Peter Osgood, and Jeff Astle, all of whom get some game time in the seventy World Cup. So you, you can see him thinking, "Right, I've got to put some strikers on the fast track." Because that's something that he hadn't organised well in, in in '68. So without without any strikers, with just Hurst and with the uh, Roger Hunt and Bobby Charlton up front, he picks a really really defensive team. Because he's got two out and out defensive midfielders there, in Norman Hunter and Alan Mull- Alan Mullery. So you, you look at the team and you think, where's where are the goals going to come from? There aren't going to be any goals. He hasn't got anyone to score him any goals. And uh, is it any wonder that it's nil-nil going into the last five minutes? Yeah. It's not just Jeff Hurst that was missing, of course, because in that friendly match against Germany, England also lost the original N'Golo Kante um, (laughs) in Nobby Styles. And he he was the guy you were looking to in midfield to break up the opposition's uh, attacks and so on, and he wasn't there. So you got a bit of a hole in midfield. Not saying that, you know, we didn't have some great midfielders. And yeah, I I think Mallory was better. Was a was a better. Yeah, and Bob Bobby Charlton raves about Nobby Styles. He thinks he was genuinely world class. My old man used to hate him. You think he just kicked people, and that's all he did. Uh, And I think Mallory was terrific. Um, and Nobby Styles, he had a problem. The fans hated him. I'm talking about international fans outside England. And th- th- this was played in, in Italy. Uh, Styles was fit for the, the third place off, which was against the Soviet Union that England won. Uh, and Hurst and Styles are both fit for this game and they come back. And Styles, he's, he's picked out as the figure of hate by the fans in the stadium in Rome. And every time he touches the ball, there's whistles and whistles and whistles and whistles. I think Styles was seen by the rest of the world as the ultimate sing- symbol of English hypocrisy. You know, fair play, fair play, fair play. And he kicked a Frenchman out of the World Cup in 66. Uh, and so he, he, was like a, he, he, he was like a hate figure. But he, he must have been a strong fella to, to have played his way through that. So we're talking about the match then. And if you've listen to the Brazilian show and their podcast for the first time, what we do is look at an iconic match from sometime in football, uh, footballing history and, and try to just remind people about the match and pick out some of the highlights of the match, but also to look at the wider context of society, politics, uh, world news, and uh, of course the soundtrack of the time, the soundtrack, if you like, to the iconic match. So we're looking at the... Um, what was it called then? What was it called? The European? What, what was it called in those days? The, there, there was. It, it may have still been the European Nations Cup. Yeah, I think it was actually. Yeah, I think you're right. It, well, it was certainly initially called the European Nations Cup, whether it was at this time or not. It, it's it's such a. We're talking about a different. Well, it's such a bizarre thing. And firstly, yeah. there's the lack of the tournament. Secondly, um, the other semi final, Italy, the hosts against the Soviet Union, finishes nil nil. So what do they do? They flick a coin. I know, that's shocking. <laughs> they flick a coin. <laughs> Italy qualify for the final. Time. Well, they haven't <laughs> thought of the penalty shootout no. at this point. Uh, they 
they haven't got time to replay the match, you know, because the final also ends as a draw and they do replay the final. Yeah. But at this point, the semi final, there's just no time in the schedule <laughs> of what little schedule there was to replay the match. So they flick a coin. Oh my word, this is schoolboy yes. football that we're talking about. The PE teacher <laughs> flicks a coin. Sorry, you lot, you've lost the other side of one. After you know the and this is th this is in our lifetime. Shocking! It's shocking. <laughs> I know. Well, we are too old for this, mate. In our lifetimes, those lucky youngers who never knew this. But once upon a time, yeah, a football match <laughs> in a tournament was decided by flicking a coin, and not once. It wouldn't have been the first time they flicked a coin. The refs used to have a coin in their pockets in those days, you know, for all sorts of reasons, not just for kickoff. OK, so let's talk about the match. And the the um, the world news context is really uh, quite profound, but we'll come on to that later on. What about this match? You've already given it away. It was a one nil victory to Yugoslavia. It was arguably one of the best matches that Bobby Moore played, I'd have thought. But he makes the mistake at the end. The uh, it's right at the end. The goal for 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 for, for Yugoslavia. They're, they're great left winger Jaich, uh, and it's a ball that's played from the other flank, and it, it takes Bobby Moore out. It goes over his head, uh, and he says that he thought about catching it, but he wasn't sure if he was in the area or not. And he was in the area, so it's probably just as well he didn't catch it. Uh, so it just caught him out, and he does a lot on the ball in this game because he has to. He has to come out and create because he hasn't got a lot of creativity in front of it. So uh, he, he comes out and he plays a lot, but at the end, it's it, it's a mistake. And, he, and he, he held his hand up. He was he was caught out by it. And uh, the cross comes in from the left. It's well taken down by Jaich. And then that left foot just crashes it past, past Gordon Banks. And there's almost no time left. But there is time left for a very, very significant moment. Indeed. And I mentioned that moment in just a moment because it's, it, it makes the headlines, that significant um, moment. But uh, you've got to give it to Dragon Jajish, don't you? Um, or Dragon Jajish? How would you pronounce the um, name? Uh, my my Serbo-Croat is, is a little bit rusty these days. In fact, I mean, I, I, this is something that fascinates me about. The dragon part you don't forget, do you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it might be dragon or something. You, know, you never know. <laughs> but for us, it's dragon. <laughs> trust me, it was a dragon's den that night. It certainly <laughs> was. Yeah, I mean, Yugoslavia. I mean, when the whole that whole thing kicked off in the early nineties, I, I just felt really remote to me. It felt like some kind of like pre-first world war Bal Balkans conflicts, and I couldn't get my head around it, and I still can't. And that that the hatreds that were involved in you know, what was once a country that obviously the, the, the political prestige and the force of Marshal Tito had kept together for, for a few decades. But it splinters then with real hatred, isn't it? A real hatred between the Serbs, the Croats, the, 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 the Bosnians and, and the other nationalities as well. And after I found out, you know, after it all, it all fell apart, it made me think, what must it have been like to be in the dressing room? of a Yugoslavia team, you know, to what extent were these simmering hatreds apparent in the dressing room? Well, I would say you mentioned Marshal Tito, and he was the strong man of Yugoslavia at the time, who held these uh, disparate nationalities together as one Yugoslavia. That was the you know, post-war consequence, if you like, but it was a 20th century thing. It was always going to happen in one form or another if an autocrat came along and he did come along um i would have said that the way that he united the country was to say like forget your ethnic differences because he was not a serb actually no i think he was croatian mm -hmm. yeah he might have been croatian so if you think about it he's subsuming his own yeah, national yeah. uh credentials to sort of unite under a Yugoslav, a joint Yugoslav flag. But I think what happens there is that a charismatic and autocratic figure can repress your inner feelings for you to all unite. But once that person has gone, I don't think history uh, uh, allows the continuation of um, the repression. So any sort of feelings that people would have had in the dressing room, 
I think that they would have just buried it. You know, it's funny, in Nigeria, there is, um, because we had the Biafran War in um, the early... Well, well, it's around late. now, isn't it? It's this time, late 60s. Exactly, exactly. And um, the eastern part of the country had uh, seceded from the federal government because of some programs that had been taking place in the north of the country. And they had, and again, charismatic autocratic governor of the east and in those days Nigeria was just divided into four four regions and um, that's why it's been split up and broken up so many times now you know it went from four after the war it went to about 12 then it went to about 20 or 30 or whatever it was however many they have now but they break it up so that n one region cannot secede again that's essentially what's happened in Nigeria but in those days the eastern region was a quarter of the country. So it was possible for General uh, Ojuku to say, look, uh, who went to school in a public school, minor public school in England, by the way, Epsom Public School. Uh, I know somebody who was there, not at the same time as him, but uh, shortly after, and tells me yeah, he was the star of their school in all sports and everything else. But it was possible for him to hold uh, the, or to secede with, from the Eastern region. But, Subsequently, what has happened is the people of the Eastern region who still feel hard done by, you know, my friends that I play football with, uh, many of them are Igbo, who would have been the tribe from that, uh, uh, from that Eastern region. Uh, they still feel a little bit, you know, like, hang on, our time will come again. But under the current Nigerian government, they just have to hold that down because that would be seen as being, um, you know, uh, treasonous to sort of uh, suggest that again. So I, I, I think that would have, is what would have happened in the dressing room in Yugoslavia. But the moment like, it, like, like, say, India before the, the partition. Indeed. Uh, and when India gets partitioned, there's just unbelievable hatreds and massacres. And one of my mates, he lost his granddad. You know, he obviously didn't know him before he was born. In one of those massacres of, of, of the, the people moving from one side of the border to the other side of the border. And people who'd lived together for years and years and years suddenly uh, 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 taking upon each other with axes and, and these bizarre, you know, it's amazing to me how these hatreds can, we from, from our country, we take the nation state and nationality for granted. No, we just because the borders are so clear, you know. Uh, and it, it, it's strange for me to think of part of the world like a lot of the African continent where, or Iraq, for example, you know, divided up in a way that ethnically inevitably unstable. Uh, it, it, it's strange for me to get my head around this, this idea of, say, a national football team, a dressing room full of people who in other circumstances might, may be enemies. Yeah, yeah. Um... You know, even though we are responsible for a lot of the colonial problems all around the world as part of our empire, when an empire breaks up, of course, uh, the colonial hold on it starts being exposed. And what was forced upon people then suddenly um, takes on a, a, a different aspect. But funny enough, the United Kingdom, it was said over and over again at the time of uh, Brexit, the United Kingdom is probably the most successful, um, you know, uh, what would it be, amalgamation of nations, you know, uh, ever. It's, it's, it's lasted, outlasted the European Union and all of these. We have held together better than any other for whatever reasons. And I'm not saying that, that there aren't... Um, Republican sentiments in all of the individual nations of the uh, United Kingdom. But nevertheless, somehow we've held together for 200 going on 300 years now. And for whatever reason, it seems to have worked for that long period. But there's nowhere else in the world that you can look at that, that an empire, you know, if you can call the United Kingdom, some kind of a, a, an empire, or at least it has this sort of a, um, framework of an empire, you know, bringing together these nations together, and we'll call it one or whatever. Um, it, it, there's no other place in the world that an empire has lasted that long. There's no, there's nowhere else. So we take it for granted because for some reason we think, you know, what's the problem with all these countries <laughs> coming together? You know, what's the problem? If we can do it, they can do it. Well, yeah, we'll wait and see. And here, here we are losing to Yugoslavia and 25 years later, there is no Yugoslavia. And still, though, 
however many years later, Alan Mullery is still the first <laughs> footballer, English footballer, to have ever been sent off in an international competition. Was he playing for Tottenham in those days? Yeah. Yeah, God, God, that must have been shocking. <laughs> I mean, do, do we do we even know? It, it's got it on this uh, the Times, Thursday, June the sixth. It's a review of the uh, match. It says late goal knocks England out. Anna Mullery sent off. That's as much of a headline as the late goal knocking England out. Partly, I would have thought that, you know, we thought, no, we English, we play football the right way <laughs> and we play in an honest way. There's, we would never get sent off. But this was a turn up for the books, wasn't it? Yeah, well, and someone had to be first isn't it? and it, it, it fell to here. But I think it was a brutal game. Uh, the the uh, the amalgamation of Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, Slovenians and whatever who were on the other side can really play. But they're hard as well. It was, uh, and England were the world champions. So Yugoslavia are, are there to stall, to, to, to run down the clock. They're, they're happy with that. And uh, we have picked Norman Hunter as well. You know, I mean... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Bites your legs. <laughs> indeed, yes. So, you know, in the end, I wonder if it was the frustration of having gone the goal down, you know, uh, and... Uh, but... The Yugoslav who um, who uh, Mallory left in a in a crumpled heap. Once Mallory was given his marching orders, he was up on his feet and running around, jumping and celebrating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he got an English player sent off. Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine uh, it was a moment of joy for them. There was an earlier moment in the match when a Yugoslavian player hacks down Alan Ball tiny wee little Alan Ball uh, red mop of hair of course and uh, Bobby Moore is so, Bobby Moore being the captain is so incensed uh, by that challenge that he wades in immediately and he could have gotten sent off you know because that Yugoslavian player was looking the Yugoslavian player is down on the ground when you know Bobby Moore wades in with that you know uh, English sense of outrage at the injustice of you know why are you picking on the little guy yeah you want to fight come on then come on yeah and... don't pick on the little guy with a squeaky voice you know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> who is soon to become England's most expensive transfer from Everton to Arsenal but that's still not happened at this point anyway but the Yugoslavian sees obviously sees an opportunity to get the blonde-haired England captain sent off and he gets up off the ground and, you know, by this time Bobby Moore's backed off, but the Yugoslavian's giving him a little bit of aggro still. And I thought, oh, is Bobby Moore going to clout in one? But he doesn't. He holds back and it's just as well because ref is standing right beside him. <laughs> I'd have thought, you know, a little bit more of that West Ham iron, uh, so to speak, quote unquote, iron fist might have uh, got Bobby Moore sent off as well. So it was 1-0. I wonder, Tim, whether this defeat, this first defeat by the England team after winning the World Cup, I wonder... Uh, don't don't say that to the Scots. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, I forgot. Wembley, yeah. 67, it's, it's, wasn't it's, it? it? It's the first oh, competitive God. defeat, unless yeah. you count the home internationals as competitive, which for the purposes of this conversation, we're not going to. <laughs> <laughs> and we had they, just lost to Germany. It's friendly to Germany a few, do, a few that, days that before. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. Come on. That does not count. The, I'll have the Scots. I'll give the Scots their dues. Um, despite the fact that they nicked half the grass in Wembley that time and left the <laughs> other half for when they beat us in uh, 78 or whenever the second time was. But um, this, the one against Germany doesn't count. But this, OK, first competitive or, you know, in an international tournament beyond the home uh, country's tournaments. I wonder whether it has an impact, though, because even if England didn't go into this match with all the, uh, the the respect for the tournament and for their opponents, I wonder if it took a bit of a shine off the world champions that still resonates two years later in Mexico. I don't think so from the point of view of the team because they were very happy to beat... They rated the Soviet Union, rated them a lot, and they beat them well in the third, fourth place off. 2-0 when, when they had Jeff Hurst back and Hurst just on that performance made the team of the tournament even though he didn't play he only played the third, fourth, third, fourth place off uh, and they only lost one game one more game on the build up to the World Cup 
and that was a that was a, a loss with with real dignity. It was here in Rio against Brazil, where they flew in, dog tired, dominated most of the game, were one 0 up, and understandably wilted in the last few minutes to lose two one. And they came away from that thinking, you know what, we're all right. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be all right for for the World Cup. I think the big effect that it has is to accelerate Ramsey's transition with his new strikers. You know, Franny Lee, after this, gets into the team and he's having a look at Osgood, Clark and, and, and Astle and so on. Uh, and it, sometimes there's a right time to lose. Sometimes you just shake it up, shake it up a little bit. It probably is the moment when the 66 team passes to the 1970 team. Um, the fullbacks are going to be are going to be different. Terry Cooper is going to come through at left back. It's the end of Ray Wilson. He's already got Keith Newton at right back as an as an attacking fullback. So uh, I, I don't think it was anything at all a, a, a blow to to to, to confidence. Um, and part of the reason why the, the, this match resonates is because right now England are you know we're on a high over here, Tim. You don't know that because you're in Brazil, but. I can guess. I can guess. Well, well, oh, to be in England in the end of June and the start indeed, of July. After we beat Germany in a European Championships uh, for the first time. And um, the first time we've beaten Germany in a competitive knockout match. First time ever. We seem to have ridden ourselves of a hoodoo. It feels like we've won the Euros, although there's still a bit of a way to go. As we speak, we're going to meet... Uh, Ukraine in the quarterfinals. We'll see Ukraine, who... if you want to. <laughs> I'm not craning. I'm not for yeah. craning. <laughs> I'm not for craning at all either. Uh, well, you know, listen to the Beatles. The UK mm. Crane girls yes. will knock you out. Yeah. Uh, not the boys, though. Not the boys. I'm not sure about the boys <laughs> knocking us out. <laughs> uh, yeah, back in the USSR. Those were the days, weren't they? Um, now, the reason why it resonates, as I say, is because we uh, people are already talking about us getting to a semi-final. So this match in 1968, where we got to the semi-final, even though we didn't quite, you know, check, have a journey into the semi-final, but nevertheless, well, beat, beat Spain final. home and away in the quarterfinals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's that, that's respectable stuff. But it wasn't quite the journey that uh, no. the teams have to go through now. Could we have won that one? Could we? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because Italy ended up winning it, didn't they? Needing a replay to do it. So yeah. Italy played three games at home, drew two of them, and won, won, uh, won the third. So, yeah. Uh, it, it, Should it, we it's have un- won it? Should we have won it is really the question there, maybe. Had Hurst not been injured, I think uh, perhaps, yes. And that, that was a, it was a great England side. That I, I think that they, they get hard done by because of the the kind of phantom goal of 66. Because every time it's that 66 is brought up here in Brazil, it's always, oh yeah, the goal that wasn't a goal. You know, the referee, the goal that wasn't a goal. And I think that's a really kind of minimalist, reductionist kind of tabloid view, like looking for the controversy. Mm-hmm. Because what England had with four four two was kind of revolutionary, uh, and I, I think that the team, ironically, in the two defeats they suffered in the seventy World Cup, showed how great they were. Because the, the performance against Brazil in seventy is magnificent. It's brilliant, yeah. And they should have beaten Germany in the quarter final. And had had Banks been not not been laid low, they would have would have beaten Germany. Uh, I think they were they were a, they were a terrific side, and uh, it is a shame that they weren't that Hurst wasn't playing, and there weren't really any, there wasn't really any any firepower, because I think their team has been hard done by, and it was probably on some of the players would say they were better away from home than they were at home, because they were a good counter attacking side. Uh, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a shame. I think had they won this, they would get more credibility, and there would be less of the of the forced controversy about the goal that maybe wasn't wasn't a goal and perhaps if they'd won this we wouldn't have had to endure another 55 years of hurts as it, it were. would change the maths and, yeah yeah but not just the maths but I, I think it would change the belief because there's been perhaps, a sense uh, yeah but it, like you say everything's been sort of referenced back to 1966 whereas i remember <clears throat> 
before Spain won a World Cup, there was time and time in, in memorial where people referenced the amount of times that they didn't win a World Cup. And they won a World Cup, but if they hadn't won, you know, a Euros after that and then another World Cup, then people would have just been referencing that one time. Yeah, they would true, have endured true. that period. Uh, we didn't win anything after 66. That yeah. was where the big It would have been like a dynasty had we won yeah, exactly, in 68. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. It would have been, good point. It would have taken a lot, off, a lot of pressure off the subsequent teams. But we always look at the... Um, the headlines in the newspapers at the time, the the, um, the context in which this match was played. Uh, Wednesday, June the 5th, 1968. It was a Wednesday. Front page of the Manchester Guardian was 30 die as Israeli forces hit Jordan Town, pal of smoke after the attack. And this is just one year after, as they point out, of um, mm -hmm. the Six-Day War. That's the headline. Um, and quite perhaps pertinent for the news that's going to come later on that day, but it will be in the papers the following day, is that President Johnson, the American president, uh, during his address to the graduating class at Glassboro State College, New Jersey, yesterday, a year ago, he met Mr. Cossigan uh, there in a summit conference. So Mr. Cossigan, I think. Uh, was the Russian, was it Foreign Secretary? I can't remember at the time. French strikers holding out in Paris. So the massive return to work hoped for today after the sunny weekend and lengthy negotiations between employers and unions failed to materialise in the chief sectors of the French economy and transport metallurgy, metallurgy, at the car industry and postal and telecommunications. Stowaway Boy again reaches the US. I thought this was a really good story, Tim a 15-year-old Grimsby boy who stowed away last year on a cargo plane and reached New York was found yesterday in Philadelphia five days after his parents had reported him missing again. Stephen Wilkins of Felstead Road, Grimsby, left home with £10 and some clothes and stowed away on a Pan American airliner which left London last Friday. Isn't that a brilliant story? That's the kind of story. That is the story that I would have immediately mm -hmm. read resonated with at that age I don't want to be that kid you know we, we, yes. we, we all wanted to stow away to the circus for example imagine if we were able to stow away like that oh my goodness uh, and had you come from Grimsby you'd probably have done it wouldn't you well even Tottenham though no it's not just Grimsby hang on we were struggling out in Tottenham as well you know I, 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 I'll give it to the you know the, the point you're making about Grimsby but Anyway, the story that is really the backdrop, it's not the backdrop, but it's the, the uh, epilogue to this match against Yugoslavia, is that was the day that Robert Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy, was assassinated. So it appears on the Thursday edition of The Guardian, uh, well, it says here, fighting for his life. I'm not sure he was still fighting for his life by the time the paper had been printed, but there's a photograph of him lying on the ground, his hands on his chest. Um, people, it's just a melee at the uh, ballroom of a hotel, I think it was. Ambassador Hotel. Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Uh, Siran Siran, I remember that name from even then, because, you know, who knew that you could have a first well, name? It, it's still yeah. shrouded in mystery even now, isn't it? You know, the, the, even the ballistics and so on. It, 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 it's still, it, it's still a, it, it's such a hugely controversial moment. But he has never denied that he was the assassin. Um, he's still serving life in prison in the United States. He'll never be released. Uh, he'll be, he was 24 then. So we're talking about, you know, somebody who's an 80 year old now, um, or, or they're about to, yeah, he'll be about 78 now he should be. And uh, he was a Jordanian. And apparently he was incensed by a comment that Senator Kennedy had made about the Middle East and um, sending planes to Israel, and he just decided he carried what was then known as a Saturday night special. You might remember is what they call these small guns uh, in the United States because you could uh, secrete them very easily into a, a lady's handbag or whatever it was. Anyway, uh, in those days, there wasn't the kind of security around um, 
the level of security that would be around a presidential candidate because of course he 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 had thrown his hat into the ring to become a president of the united states you know I always think of, I, 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 I remember this story, you know, I would have been eight years old at this point, but it was one of those, you know, what, what uh, I thought it was John F. Kennedy that got assassinated. Oh, he, his brother got assassinated as well. It was just kind of like a real shock to the system as such. But what, what I always think about when I, now what I think about is um, the anecdote of uh, a woman who's no longer with us, who's uh, a correspondent for us on uh, Five Live, uh, a woman called Connie Lorne, who had been a White House um, correspondent for many years. She was a veteran, a White House correspondent, probably the most veteran of all the correspondents while she was still um, uh, reporting from there. And she said she met Bobby Kennedy on a few occasions. She said, after the assassination of his brother, he became a nervous wreck. He was really jumpy. You know, he'd hear a car backfire and he'd jump or duck or whatever. So he lived a life of fear and yet he their family or he himself thought that you know my destiny is to take up from where my brother left off and um, you know give my life to political service or whatever it was or i don't know whether he was pushed um, it felt like a duty a family duty or whatever it was but this is a guy that was nervous he was nervous of being shot and that's exactly what happened to him and he uh- after the years after his, his brother had gone, he had veered really strongly to the left, mm-hmm. which is why, from a political point of view, this is such a such an important moment because he would probably have got the Democratic nomination and would probably have won. And with all of the consequences for Vietnam and so on, instead of which you get Nixon with all, all of the consequences of that. I mean, it, it, it's such a... And in Europe as well, it's such a revolutionary stroke, counter-revolutionary moment. And those scenes from like France, 68, uh, swept through swept through Italy as well. Didn't touch England anything like as much. You know, people will remember the, the demonstrations outside the US embassy at Grosvenor Square. But in 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 certainly in France, the, the, the whole 68 movement of the students and links between students and industrial workers. It, it seemed that there was there was a real kind of revolutionary potential, which from today's point, it, it, it's it's hard to imagine how how serious that danger that 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 threat of genuine revolutionary movements seemed at the time. And you're right to bring that in because this is where the conspiracies come in. Yeah. And um, as much as I accept that Siran Siran has never denied that he was the assassin. One doesn't know the trajectory ever in these situations of um, of disparate interest that can create an atmosphere that leads to the assassination. his, his His stated motive doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Well, it, it, it does if you are a hot-headed um, young um, uh, activist. Maybe activist. Yeah, but right what, what, what he's done, he, he's facilitated the victory of people who are even I know. more. You know, well, this is the point I'm making. That's exactly the point I'm making, Tim. But sometimes we are all pawns in the game. I don't know. I'm not saying that there was a conspiracy or whatever it is, but I could see that if you are a certain person that a climate can be um, created, uh, whether it's directed towards you in particular or the climate is just put in place so that somebody like you, and there might be more than one of you, wants to take i mean we've seen all the terrorism that's come from you know uh, so-called islamist terrorism it's not necessarily that the, the the person over in the uk or any other country has a direct beef uh with our country but a climate is brought together where somebody somewhere else says well you know look what they're doing to our people and um, you know, and this country is complicit in it. 
And then if you in your mind see that that country is complicit in it, you're, you're, you're drawn to suddenly become part of the uh, problem, even though what you're doing sometimes is attacking your own people. Mm -hmm. you know? Did you know, I, I, I just wonder with all of these, there are all sorts of questions about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was attorney general at the time of his um, brother's presidency. And even there, there were some uh, left leaning um, positions that he took, not least in terms of the march on Washington in 1963. Uh, Martin Luther King has been assassinated uh, just a few months before. Mm. And even though, even though uh, uh, James Earl Ray was clearly the, uh, the assassin, although he denied that he was the assassin, or at least he gave the impression that it wasn't, or he was just the patsy or whatever it was, uh, just like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. You just wonder... Whether they pulled the trigger or not, where was the protection that Martin Luther King should have had? Where was the protection that John F. Kennedy should have had? Where was the protection that Robert F. Kennedy should have had? You know, all, all these... Um... Well, it was certainly very convenient to powerful interests that King leave the scene because his, his journey has taken him to conclusions that have become totally opposed to the Vietnam War. Uh, it's, it's, it's convenient for, the, for, for, for a power structure which is dependent on producing arms and selling weapons. It's convenient that the potential huge opponent of the war be removed from the scene, isn't it? But then again, <clears throat> maybe it was just cold-blooded murder by an individual and even though the climate you can use that as an excuse mm -hmm. um we, we can always find an excuse for these things um but we just don't know so we have to say siran siran is uh responsible for the death of bobby kennedy we have to say james or ray is responsible for the death of uh of uh, martin luther king uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, there's a no, question I'm not, mark I'm, I'm not, Yeah, I'm not having that one. You know, <laughs> a, feat of, a feat of marksmanship like that from someone not capable of, of a feat of marksmanship, you know, that, that one. And also, you know, the, uh, well, the, the lone nut, you know, the lone nut who does it to achieve attention. Well, has there the, ever, ever in the history of lone nuts, uh, has there ever been a lone nut who said it wasn't me? Well, yeah, yeah, no, sure. And um, if they do it to gain attention, imagine, yeah, imagine yeah. that he's that he is what he's what he's purported to be this this disenchanted lone nut looking for revenge on a on yeah. a on a hostile world. Yeah. Imagine if he's pulled off a feat of marksmanship that is 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 very very difficult for a top for yeah, a top yeah. marksman. Imagine yeah. if he's done that. Yeah. Say, yeah, it was me. I took him out. Instead of which, he's so cool. He gets beaten up by the police. Yeah. Hours and hours of questioning. Mm. And he's lying all the way through his. Mm. I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what? It's the, the strangest lone nut in the history of lone nuts. I think the strangest thing is Jack Ruby. You know, it's kind yeah. of like, well, yeah. hang on a second. Why, why have you, you yeah. know, you're, you're a gangster. Why have you decided to take on, you know, the moral high ground for yeah, all yeah. Americans? <laughs> make, Please, it's yeah. preposterous, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, uh, but we'll never know. <laughs> Tim, we will never know, will we? <laughs> Whether you're having not. it or not having it. <laughs> We will never know. What we do know is that Yugoslavia <laughs> beat England one day. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that we know. Yeah, Let's talk although, about although <laughs> <laughs> after um, after uh, Sonny Liston had destroyed yeah. Floyd Patterson and won the heavyweight championship of the world, Norman Mailer had predicted a Patterson win, I think. Yeah. And uh, so he turns up absolutely pissed to the press conference the next morning, Sonny Liston yeah. giving his press conference as champion. And Norman Mailer said, yeah, well, it looks like you'd massacred him within about a minute, but existentially <laughs> Patterson got up, got up and, 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 and ended up winning the fight. So uh, Norman Mailer got away with it. So uh, maybe Yugoslavia didn't really win. Maybe existentially <laughs> England won. In the end. Okay. But... <laughs> 
what we do know when we look at the soundtrack of all of these it's all a conspiracy exactly it's all a conspiracy all these conspiracy and look at it Jaich scored the goal with his left foot it's all a left wing <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> Tim, you know how to do this so well. Let's talk about the left-wing conspiracy soundtrack at the time. Uh, Gosh, Young Girl by Union Gap is number one. I mean, it's an interesting chart. Mm. Um, There's a couple of things that we should point out straight away. Um, What do you want to point out? Well, I want to point out that it is shocking the amount of people in the charts, in the top 10, who are basically trying to copy the small faces. The yeah. small faces yeah. are the only uh, original. Um, well, they are the best of the bunch of uh, Union Gap. Um, you could argue Love Affair, Love Affair. Um, the Herd, the Herd. Yeah, indeed, or Herd as they're called. They're they're all trying to be the small faces. Thankfully, yeah, but, see, but, but and the, the small faces were all, they were trying to be Booker T and the MGs. Everyone's trying to well, be someone else. Well, yeah, you could. But they, say they went that. beyond that. I, I think they, they, this is the some, song. Yeah. They're in the charts at number nine with "Lazy Sunday," mm. and I think it, it's the the most by far the most fascinating song of this chart. Sure, because it's a song that kills them. What? Because it it's is. so successful. Yeah, and I'll, I'll explain that one. It's a great song, um, and you and I we're we're from like the last generation when the idea of a generation gap was really prevalent Mm. because our fathers had no conception of youth culture, did they? I had no conception at all. It freaks me out when I hear about kids who were, Oh yeah. Yeah. I was listening to my dad's clash album. Mm. No, I mean, my, my, they're just too old for that. That, So there's that real generation gap that the Beatles did brilliantly in she's leaving home. There's that line, mm. she's leaving home after living alone for so many years. Mm. And it's a generation gap in a line. It's brilliant. The small, the, the, the small faces, they do it in this song from a kind of happy perspective. It's mm. a line, here we all are sitting mm. on a rainbow. Mm. Hello, Mrs. Jones. How's your Burt's Lumbago? <laughs> yeah, that's rainbow. A good <laughs> and you can just imagine them, you know, like lolling around, yeah. lolling around in a, in a, in a, sitting on a park bench or something like that. You know, they're all, they're all high on something. Mm-hmm. And Mrs. Jones, the East End matriarch walks past and they you know, have, have, a, have a conversation about her husband's lumbago. Mm-hmm. It's a brilliant take on, 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 on a generation gap, but, and they were great. They started off wanting to be Booker T. And the, they, there's, there's, there's a magic between Marriott and Lane. It's a little bit like Lennon and McCartney. Yeah, Apart, yeah, then they're, yeah. they're, 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 you know, they're nothing like they were together. Yeah, they, they, they had a little bit about them individually, but not like they were together, just like exactly. Lennon and McCartney. Yeah, I mean, Marriott on his own, he just wants to be a, 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 a gimme, 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 yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, blues mm. type mm. shouter. And Lane on his own is a little bit too kind of wistful. You put them together yeah, and you, yeah. you, you get. But this song, because it, it's, it's the big change of the era. Started with Sgt. Pepper, the album. And albums didn't really exist before as, as a, you know, they were just a filler. You know, you the three hit singles and, and, and filler. And then the album comes in. And what you don't want, if anymore if you're a cool rock band r&b band and all of these people are playing r&b because there's nothing else rock is just in the process of being invented what you suddenly what you don't want is to be a teeny bop band with lots of screaming fans exactly the very thing that you wanted two or three years earlier but now it's uncool 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 and lazy sunday it was a, a big hit record but also because they had a laugh about it, they they East ended it up, you know, rinky dinky do, yeah. rinky dinky. Yeah, of course, know. yeah, yeah. It, it it was like a novelty record, mm. and it became a toilet seat around their necks. Uh, Ian, Ian Mack used to talk about this, you know, what what a, what a bastard it was because it broke them up because it wasn't what suddenly that wasn't cool anymore because suddenly there's a change in the zeitgeist, which goes along with all of this revolutionary stuff and so on. Suddenly, there's a change in the drugs where it had been speed. Now it's gone 
from weed to LSD and more reflective stuff. You know, the, the, with the speed, you're producing three minute tight urban symphonies. With the other drugs, more reflective stuff that's stretched out, spaced out. Also, get away from the screaming fans. The bands want, want, they want some kind of private life. You know, the screaming fans was great for a year, maybe two years, but then it just gets too much. So what do they do? They go out to the country and it became like a, like a joke, you know, almost like a, uh, you know, we're going to the country to get our heads together, man. You know, like with Nail and I parried it so well with the going on holiday to the, we've gone on holiday by mistake, you know, going out, going out to the countryside. And so you, you, you're beginning to get here, 68, the birth of rock, a form that has never existed before. We, we always talk, think about it as if, you know, it, it's been there forever and ever. No, it's, it, it's being invented now. Changes in amplification mean you can, you can get a kind of heavier sound. And so you're transitioning from the Yardbirds, who are R&B, to Led Zeppelin. And when you're Led Zeppelin, you don't want to do three-minute tight R&B-based things. And you don't want to do singles. Fuck that. That's not cool anymore. You want to do albums. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's longer and it's more pretentious. And it's, it, it, so it, it's an entirely different thing. So what you're seeing in this chart is all of those ones who wanted to be the small faces, who wanted to be Booker T and the MGs, they're now starting to want to be some, something else. Uh, and a big example for me is it's a great song, Wheels on Fire. Julie Driscoll and, and Brian Alger and the Trinity, who used to play with Rod Stewart. It was, and it was R&B, R&B, R&B. Now what have they done? It's still R&B because you can hear, and especially in his Hammond playing, in Brian Alger's Hammond playing. But what they've done here, they've taken a Dylan song and they've kind of psychedelic it up a little bit. We're beginning to go in new directions. You know, even though the, 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 uh, the, herds, the herd thing, you're, you're beginning to hear a little bit of flower power and not just the R and B that there was two or three years, years earlier. So I think it's a, it's a really big moment in musical history because a few years earlier, everyone was only playing R and B because there was nothing else. Now you're inventing new forms. It's all, it's all starting to go out in, in, in new directions. You see, that's exactly how I see lazy Sunday. I, I see it in, as a inventive amalgamation of what you called a you know cockney's cockneyization of uh rinky dinky do whatever you call it <laughs> but you see if the kinks had done that we wouldn't yeah. be talking about this you know kinks fair enough predate uh, small faces by a year or two but nevertheless that's exactly what they were doing. Ray Davis was doing was bringing in a little sense of the, um, if you like, East End contemporary vaudeville into yeah, popular true. music. And I think where you where you're right is that they went away from this. I mean, Ichiku Park, Ichiku Park is not for me the highlight of. Uh, the faces, although I can hear resonance of this in that. But I think this is the one where they capture Britain at a moment, mm. not just with the generation gap, but it's also <clears throat> the moment where the East End and Cockneys, we're not embarrassed about that anymore. We're not embarrassed yeah. that. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll bring that to the forefront of popular musical culture. Well, the, the, the amazing and thing is Marriott hated this. Absolutely hated it. Although it's totally him, hundred percent. He hated it. He didn't want to do it. You know. So yeah, yeah. and after well, after he's done it, fuck, I hate that. So yeah. you know, he goes off and forms Humble Pie, yeah, and it's like yeah. cod American rock. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it's nothing like as good. But the, the point I was going to make is exactly that that they might have been influenced about uh, by the change in the you know, the, the zeitgeist, the popular music zeitgeist, they might have been influenced a bit too much. Like the Beatles were, you know, you can sort of get taken away by this idea that, oh, no, no, let's reject everything that is pop, even though that is your, your, your trade. You know, your trade is to make three minutes pop music, whether on an album or on a single, I don't give a shit about that, but I want to see what the final result is. And the result of all the things that the faces do, this is a one that stands the test of time. You know, this is the one that you 
revert to over and over again. And you say, wow, at that moment, they managed to bring together all these influences in their lives that make up an artist, you know. Um, and, and isn't it ironic that they killed it killed them as a band? I think if you look at it as, if you look at the band splitting up as the band being killed, fair enough. But if you look at them still, as the band still resonating 15 yeah, true, years true, after, true, true. I think this is what keeps them alive and will keep them alive for a long, long time to come. Um, another track in those in that top ten is Jumping Jack, Flash, The Rolling Stones. Mm. Um, I think that's the most punky record that The Rolling Stones have ever had. By the way, just going back to punk, The Small Faces were probably one of the biggest influences on real punk artists. I would say uh, we all kind of wanted to be a little bit of The Small Faces at this phase in, in their career that. They're having a lot of fun and they were tearing it up somewhat. Uh, and I think that's really the essence of punk. We were having a lot of fun, but we were tearing it up somewhat. Here, Jumping Jack Flash, the Rolling Stones, yeah, they have a little bit of that attitude. Don't give a shit. Let's just have some fun and tear it up. Who cares what the message is? Let's just make a really, well, really good record. Jag, Jag is a, a really bright fella, I think. You, you don't necessarily see it when he's interviewed. But you know, but the, he went the to lyrical... the LSC, didn't he? Yeah, he Wasn't did. He? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Said, I mean, he's not a dummy. No, well, the, the lyrical thing right boys from the well. start, uh, mm. because they really captured a zeitgeist, don't they? I mean, the, I think Jumping Jack Flash is an incredible record, unbelievable. Get... I saw them a few years back on the beach here in Rio, and they, they opened up with Jumping Jack Flash, and it for it's just a, one of the great riff based English blues songs. I think it's amazing. And it's resonant maybe, of satisfaction, though. The riff is resonant. Yeah, of yeah, but why not? And uh, yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> around the same, if you're going to rip anyone off, why not rip yourself off? Um, and just a little bit later, I think they captured a zeitgeist as well with Street Fighting Man, you know, the, 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 the scenes at Grosvenor Square and, 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 and so on. I think they're at their, at their absolute peak around this time. I was going to say, uh, the, the, uh, it's not the, opposite or the juxtaposition it's really the uh, person that is somewhat resonant of the rolling stones is eddie grant of the equals um the equals has got to number one i think about at least two if not three times uh since 1968 here they are um after black skin blue eyed boys they've got this riff that is very very much like the rolling stones you yeah know, baby yeah. come back has got the same yeah. riff there. And eddie, yeah eddie grant yeah. he's he was a clever guy as well he mm. was a clever guy and i've fallen out with eddie grant by the way and i think it's okay now but uh years ago he broke the uh the um uh the 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 rules on not um uh benefiting from the apartheid um um you know, regime by having your music there. There was a boycott, of course, of the South African um, pop charts. So he, he had a record deal in South Africa that he shouldn't have had, and uh, he probably regrets it now. And he came out with this song called Give Me Hope, Joanna, which was an anti-apartheid song, but he had this record deal out there, and I was a person who broke the story on that. Anyway, that's a long time ago. Uh, I've spoken to him since then, and, you know, fair enough. I, I don't hold anything against him. I don't think he holds anything against me. But Baby Come Back... Um, was this black guy realizing that you need to be a rock star in this pop world. And he modeled himself on being like a rock star. You know, a lot of the black guys were a little bit too cool to do what uh, Eddie Grant did with, you know, which is wearing blonde wigs or whatever it was in those days. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, no, Jimi Hendrix was the one, but and this is Jimi Hendrix time as well, very much. But Jimi Hendrix was never a pop star as such, you know, whereas Eddie Grant, he knew music, he knew very well, you know, let me put pop together and give it a little bit of the rock star swagger and, you know, I'll be like Mick Jagger. And I think he succeeded in this one. It's still, out of all the songs in the charts, it's probably the the one that still lasts as a pop song, as a pop song. Lazy Sunday has become somewhat idiosyncratic. Like I say, it's, it's the punk's favourite. Joanna by Scott Walker, brilliant track, but 
I, I, I don't think it kind of resonates uh, till today. Uh, the Ingelbert Humperdinck, it was good until the verse starts. Oh my God, the verse is terrible. I feel feel bad about him. Yeah. But, you know, th this was the age of the crooner as well, as I said, yeah, uh, Scott Walker, true. Ingelbert Humperdinck is in there. And there's one or two others. Andy well. Williams. Elvis Presley, US Mail, which ain't a bad track, but you know, that, that's uh, those days. And Tom Jones in there as well with Delilah. Um, Think with Aretha Franklin is. Yeah, in see, there's, there's so much great stuff. And even amazing, though I, I think the standard has probably declined from a year and two years before because mm. some of the big hitters are now going to albums. Yeah, so there, yeah. there is, but th I'm not that's sure. Opened up that's opened oh, up space exactly for, for T-Rex yeah. Tyrannosaurus yeah, Rex yes. Deborah, 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 Deborah. It, it's really interesting to me that Deborah when T-Rex were at their their peak in the early 70s Deborah is the one that gets reissued because yeah, it, yeah. it's the one from that time which is least kind of hippy dippy away with the fairies mm -hmm. and it, it, there's there's more of a kind of Chuck Berry in it yeah you know. although the lyrics are still hippy dippy yeah, away the fairies hippie, hippie. oh deborah you look like a zebra you're yeah. just thinking what's going to rhyme with deborah oh, just it? like voice and rolls royce you know that's a yeah. mark Bolin thing isn't it and young girl is a great song in it it's just a great song yeah, um, it is it is it is but i'm not i'm, I'm not an amateur yeah you know, I, I, sorry country is not really my stuff but the the, the Bobby, Bobby Goldsboro, yeah, yeah, that kind of country <laughs> pop that he does. I think it's nice. It you know, is. This it is, is my favourite. Really I, I love "Summer" it the is. first time. A few yeah, years later, of course. Um, I mean, th this is so what, evocative. But that's what he did, wasn't it? He told stories like a yes. country singer. These were like they're the griots of their of their yes. time yeah, and the uh, uh, of their genre because you know they're going to tell you a story and you believe it when he sings it. When you lived in LA, did you have Dion Warwick? going around your head all the time. What about, is this the way to San Jose? Yes. I think, I think when I went to San Jose, yeah, you can't help. Yeah. <laughs> not but, really you know, you when just, I lived in LA. But, but see, when I, like, like, sunny days. Yes, yes. No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I've never been there. So I, you know, I don't know. When I went to San Jose, believe me, on your way, it's just like when you go to San Francisco, you know, you, you're wondering whether you should have a flower in your hair or whatever it is. Um, yeah. The, the great thing about America is you go anywhere almost and there is a song that comes to mind, that pops to mind, a resonance. Yeah, it's all, it's all been mythologized so of well. Of course, of course. And in, a, in, a, in a way that, uh, that uh, Lincoln... England can't be, you know, it just can't be how Grimsby. Tottenham, you know. Tottenham, London can't be. I'm sure someone will. I'm sure you know, someone will. A, a lot of, you know, a lot of great black American music as well. Think from Aretha. Otis is in there with Happy Song. Mm. O.C. Smith, son of a Hick uh, Hickory that. Hollis Tramp. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. showstoppers. It ain't nothing Solomon but a house King. party. What about Solomon King in there Solomon when we King. were young? Yeah, yeah. Uh, William Bell tribute to a king, you know, uh, about the, the, the death of Martin Luther King, yeah, yeah. Gene Chandler, of course. And he was the one who Nothing gave me my name, me. the Duke. Yes, Duke, 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 Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl, Duke, Duke, Duke of Earl, Duke, 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 Duke of Earl. <laughs> See, this, this is my beef with like the meatloaf fans, you know, <laughs> like. Yeah, I've even, noticed on social media that beef yeah. has continued. <laughs> but like, back in 68, even the schlock is great. Uh, Honey Bus, I Can't Let Maggie Go. It's just lovely. It's just beautifully. It makes you happy. You know, it's yeah. a lovely, airy little sound. Ohio Express, yummy, yummy, yummy. Yeah, God, yeah. love yeah. Yeah, It just makes you, it makes you happy. Uh, Jackie, White Horses, yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful, ethereal, <laughs> reminds me of, of, of my childhood. The Birds, You Ain't Going Nowhere, The Birds mm -hmm. just beginning to get into a country vibe. Not really my stuff, but no, I'm glad no. it's around. You know, and you just look everywhere and you think there was so much great stuff going on. And they still Meanwhile reference, fans. yeah, they still reference the old days with Bill Hades. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock, five, six, seven o'clock. Every brother's still in the charts from the 1950s, you know, making the cut. I, I think what this chart tells me, and Summertime Blues makes a, a re um, a, a revisit as well into the chart, Teddy Cochran. I think what this chart tells me is that people are up for anything. People I think we're just anything. on the cusp. We're on the cusp of, there's the, because a lot of the the early to mid sixties, 
is you've never had it so good. Mm. It's the first time. Go and enjoy yourself for crying out loud. Yeah. Yeah. And just getting to this point, we're reaching that rock thing when things are going to get a bit darker and a bit uh, more. Again, this is the zeitgeist. This is this is Robert Kennedy and this is France 68. That's going to be reflected in music. But do you know but what also, else? Go on. Also, as as the the, the record mark, uh, the the public is is getting younger as well. Mm-hmm. There's 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 room for stuff directed at them. Do you know what? Uh, That's exactly right. What what is also going to happen in music? just after this is that a lot of Caribbean music is going to start slipping into the charts. All your old uh, rock steady and blue beat songs suddenly will start appearing from the late Do you 60s. Know Skinhead Eddie's Weed Dreaming. All that. Do you know Eddie's Dreaming by Small Faces? Oh, I can't remember that one. How's right. it go? Well, once we finish this, go and listen to Eddie's Dreaming by Small yeah. Faces. Mm. It, it, it's got a Caribbean vibe to it. Mm. And it reminds me so much of some of the earlier, the very early proto salsa stuff that Fania were doing in New York and how on earth the small faces managed to, to get a hold on that. It's one of the great mysteries. If you don't know it, or if you've forgotten it, go and check out Eddie's dreaming. You'll, I think you'll be it's intrigued. Not, it's not a mystery to me because uh, Paul Simon had already gone to, well, actually he might not have gone yet, but he's just about to go to Jamaica to get um, Mother and Child Reunion recorded. The Beatles have already come out with Obla Di Obla Obla Di Obla Obla Da, yeah. which Marmalade, who are in the charts now, are going to cover and get to number yeah, one. Small, small Face have done this a couple of years earlier. So uh, a couple six, of years, 60, okay. 66, 67, you know, so go, go and listen to it. I will. Later on, you can can tell me what you think of it. I will. Yeah, that's good enough. Why not? That's good enough. Um, Yeah, conspiracy theories aside, you happy with that, Mark? Uh, Yeah, it was great. I loved it. Um, Do you know, once again, once again, classic episode, isn't it? Yeah, once again, I think 